so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. This episode contains graphic depictions of violent crimes and child abuse. Listener discretion is advised. It's a sunny winter's morning in Sydney in 1960. An eight-year-old Graham Thorne is leaving his family's Bondi home. He's dressed in his grey Scots College school uniform and is clutching his brown school case. He yells out to his three-year-old sister Belinda as he heads out the front gate of 79 Edward Street, an address that had just been plastered across national newspapers alongside the names and faces of his entire family after his dad won the infamous Opera House Lottery. Bye, calls Graham before heading toward the corner store on Wellington Street to buy a bag of chips, his weekday routine. He's expecting to be picked up, like always, by his mother's friend Phyllis Smith, who will drive him and her two sons the six minutes up the road to school. But when Phyllis pulls up to collect him at their predetermined time of 8.30am, Graham is nowhere to be seen. Graham! Graham! Graham? At 9.47am, the Thorns' home phone starts ringing. A man with a European accent has Graham. He wants £25,000 by 5pm that afternoon. If I don't get the money, I'll feed him to the sharks, he says. It's a threat that will lodge itself into the collective memories of Sydney siders for decades to come. And a missing persons case that will lead to the biggest manhunt in Australia's history. It's a crime which has shocked every parent, every citizen. It's a crime which every Australian hoped would never happen here. Every parent will echo the plea of the kidnapped boy's father. A plea of a man who doesn't know if his son is alive or dead. I'm Gemma Bath. And this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Mark Tedeschi. As a barrister and Crown Prosecutor for more than 40 years, Mark has worked on some of Australia's most significant criminal cases. He's also the author of critically acclaimed non-fiction titles including Kidnapped, which tells the story of Australia's first known kidnapping of a child for ransom and what can only be described as the trial of the 20th century. Mark, I want to start with the Opera House Lotteries. What were they back in the day? The Opera House Lottery was originally designed by the New South Wales government to raise money to pay for the Opera House. And it was one of the first government lotteries that had really, really substantial prize money. And um, one of the very first Opera House lotteries was in June 1960, and the prize was £100,000. Now, it may not sound a lot today, but in fact, with that amount of money, the equivalent at that time, you could buy 12 standard ordinary houses with. So it was a very large sum of money. The other big difference between then and today is that the uh, people who organised the lottery, wanted to have complete openness and wanted to be able to convince the public that everything was above board about the lottery. So they published the names and addresses of the winners of major prizes and even photographs. Of course, after this tragic case that we're about to speak about, that changed and uh, the names and addresses of winners were no longer published. I understand having names and faces there, but addresses is next level to actually publish those in the newspaper for everyone to see. It seems strange today, but you've got to consider that in 1960 they had very different concepts about privacy and um, 
people didn't bat an eyelid. The other thing is that if you knew somebody's name and address, you could ring up the telephone exchange and get their phone number. So there's no privacy or checks as to why you might be calling them? No, that's correct. Tell me about the Thorne family. Who were they in the 1960s? The Thorne family was a very modest, typical working-class family. Basil, the father, was a travelling salesman. Frida, his wife, was a housewife. They had three children, one of whom was Graham, who in 1960 was eight years old. He was a reserved boy, very polite, very friendly, generally obedient. His parents, Basil and Frida, were ordinary, unremarkable, hard-working Australians who were quite strict with their children, and they struggled to make ends meet. They had skimped and saved their money to send their only son to Scots College in Woolara in Sydney. And they lived in a modest, rented apartment in Bondi. So Basil used to buy these Opera House lottery tickets, which were about three pounds. That's quite a lot relative to the average pay packet then. But I suppose for him it paid off because actually he won the lottery, didn't he? Yes, he won first prize in the Opera House lottery on the 1st of June, 1960. And... uh, his name, address, and a photograph of him holding the winning ticket was published in uh, major newspapers. Let's go to the morning of July 7, 1960. What happened that morning? Graham was off to school? Eight-year-old Graham Thorne did what he always did. He left home to walk a few blocks from his home to a little corner shop where the mother of another boy who was in his class was due to pick him up. He would sometimes go into the shop and buy something to eat and then wait for this other mother to pick him up. But his routine didn't unfold as usual that day because when the other mother arrived, Graham wasn't where he should have been. What do we know about what actually happened that morning? Well, what we know is that Stephen Bradley, the kidnapper, had devised a plan to kidnap Graham on his way to school. He parked his own car, a vivid blue Ford Custom Line, on a corner where Graham would have to walk right past his car. And we know that Stephen Bradley got out of his car to go and talk to Graham and that he told Graham that the mother who normally picked him up wasn't coming that day and that he'd been sent to pick him up instead. So Graham got into his car. Unfortunately for Stephen Bradley, but fortunately for the police and for justice, just as Stephen Bradley got out of his car, a man by the name of Cecil Denmead was driving past and saw this car parked right on the corner in a very unusual spot for somebody to park and saw this man getting out of his car and thankfully Cecil Denmead was a car enthusiast and he had a good look at the car as he went past and a good look at the man as he went past and he was able to later give the police a very concise description of the vehicle and also a description of the man who got out of it. And what happened after Graham got into Stephen's car? I know there's a ransom call that he makes that became quite memorable. Stephen Bradley drove to a phone box near to the Spit Bridge on the northern side of Sydney. So he'd driven from Bondi where he picked up Graham. At some stage during that journey, he turned what was a voluntary lift into a forced abduction because Graham thought that he was going to school, but at some stage he would have become alarmed and would have realised that this man was not driving him to his school. So Stephen Bradley secured Graham Thorne in the car. He then drove to near the Spit Bridge and made the first call from a public phone box near the Spit Bridge. And he made the call to 
the Thorns family home. Now, he assumed that whoever answered the phone at the Thorns home would not have realised that Graham was already missing. And that was rather deluded on his part because the fact of the matter was that when the mother came to pick up Graham outside the shop and realised that he wasn't there, she went to the school, dropped her own son at the school, made inquiries and found out that Graham hadn't arrived at school and then drove straight to Frida, Graham's mother, to report that Graham hadn't turned up at school and hadn't been at the shop. Frida was immediately concerned and immediately rang the police and a police officer had already arrived at her home and was being told information about Graham when the phone rang. It was Frida who picked up the phone and the man at the other end said, is that you, Mrs Thorne? And Frida said, yes. He then said, is your husband at home? And she said, why? And the man said, I have your son. Now, in abject horror at that stage, Frida handed the phone over to the police sergeant who then pretended to be Basil Thorne. Now, unfortunately, whilst a lot of Australians had seen the photograph of Basil Thorne and knew that he'd won this fabulous prize, this policeman was one of the few people who didn't know. So when he took the phone, the man on the other end said to him, I want you to get together £25,000 as a ransom for your son and I'll ring you back at five o'clock to tell you what to do with it. The poor sergeant really didn't know what to say and what he said was some words that he was later to deeply regret. What he said to Bradley was this, how on earth do you expect me to get money like that together in a short time? To which Stephen Bradley replied, If you don't have it ready, I'll feed him to the sharks. Now, today we don't often see things in the media about shark attacks in Sydney, but let me tell you that at that time, in the 1950s and early 1960s, there were many more shark attacks around Sydney than there are today. So it was a very potent threat that he'd issued. So that was the first contact from the kidnapper that the thorns had. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with former Senior Crown Prosecutor Mark Tedeschi about the kidnapping of Graham Thorne. Was Graham's disappearance a huge kind of unusual thing to happen at the time? Look, I remember the media frenzy and I remember the photographs of Graham that were on every newspaper day after day after day. And I remember looking at the photograph and thinking to myself, I must remember what he looks like so that if I ever see him, I can tell my parents and they can notify the police. It was a huge event because up until then, to my knowledge, there had never been in the whole history of Australia, a kidnapping of a child for ransom, that was what made it a major news event throughout Australia, but it was also broadcast around the world because there'd been, in the years before then, there'd been some very high-profile kidnappings, one in the United States, the Lindbergh child, and... um, One in Europe, a child from the Peugeot family had been kidnapped for ransom. So those kidnappings overseas had garnered international attention and this one in Sydney also got attention around Australia and around the world. So a police operation was started to try and find Graham. I know they called in police who were on leave, they had criminals involved. It was one of the biggest manhunts in Australian history, but what? evidence did they initially have to go off? Look, when the police interviewed the Thorns that day, Frieda Thorne had remembered that about three weeks earlier, at about 7pm one night, this strange man 
had knocked on her front door and had asked us some funny questions looking for somebody with a foreign name. And then when she said that nobody of that name lived there, he said that he was a private detective. She directed the man to go to the lady who lived upstairs who'd been living in that complex for much longer time. But she found the man very strange. So when the police interviewed her, she immediately told them about this man and the police decided that this was the kidnapper conducting surveillance. So the police knew very early in the piece that Frida Thorne could identify the kidnapper and she was able to give a description. And he was a man who had a foreign accent, a quite a strong foreign accent. And when the, all the publicity came out within 24 hours of the kidnapping and the ransom demand, Cecil Denmead went to the police to say that he'd seen this man parked in a very strange location and he gave a precise description of the car and the man. So very early in the piece, the police already knew that the man they were looking for had a foreign accent, drove an iridescent blue Ford Custom Line and they embarked upon a huge endeavour to try and locate a Ford Custom line that had been used in the kidnapping. Now, the police made a mistake at that early stage of the investigation. They assumed that no rational kidnapper would use his own car and they decided that it must have been a stolen vehicle or a vehicle that had been borrowed by the kidnapper from someone else. So they went to the Department of Motor Transport Records and worked out how many cars there were of that kind, but they didn't just restrict it to the iridescent blue. They thought that there was a possibility that it was a stolen vehicle that had been repainted. So they worked out that out of 270,000 Ford cars in New South Wales, there were about 4,000 that were this particular model, which was a 1955 Ford Custom Line, in any colour. And they tried to interview every single owner of such a Ford Custom Line to try and locate one that had been stolen or borrowed by someone, thinking, as I said, that no rational kidnapper would use his own car. One of the people that they interviewed was Stephen Bradley because he was the owner a registered owner of one of those cars. And he was asked, as indeed all of the owners were asked, where was your car on this particular day? Was it in your possession? Was it lent to anybody? Had it been stolen? Questions like that. And, of course, he answered all those questions by saying the car was in my garage. No, it wasn't lent to anybody. No, it wasn't borrowed. It wasn't stolen. So he, like many other owners of Ford Custom Lines, was excluded as having ownership of the relevant car. So that was the situation until about 36 hours after the kidnapping when a man found Graham's school case and cap discarded in bush near to the Wakehurst Parkway. Rather ominously, Graham's lunchbox with all of his lunch was in the school bag untouched. It was not until about five and a half weeks later after the kidnapping that Graham's body was found on a vacant block in Grandview Grove at Seaforth. And the whole nation of Australia was horrified at the murder of this child when his parents had been so willing to pay the ransom money the night of the kidnapping, Graham's father, Basil, had gone on national television pleading with the kidnappers to make contact with him, pleading with them to return his son and that he would pay any amount of money for the return of his son. So the whole of Australia was horrified when this boy's body was found. When it was found, the body had a silk scarf that had been used as a gag around his head and a particular type of picnic blanket 
strapped around the body. And Graham's clothing was very, very carefully scrutinised. And it was from the silk scarf, the picnic blanket and Graham's clothing that the police, for the first time in New South Wales policing history, were able to use some forensic science techniques that today are commonplace, but at that time they were almost unknown. And that forensic science played a major role in the discovery of who had kidnapped and murdered this boy. Yeah, I want to go through some of these forensic techniques because even knowing what we can do today with forensics, it's fascinating hearing the way that investigators at the time kind of piece this all together with all of these clues. The first forensic science testing that was done was to try and work out how long Graham had been deceased. And what they worked out was that he had died very soon after his kidnapping and he'd been deceased for really the five and a half weeks between the kidnapping and when the body was found. And the next thing that they found was that on the blanket and his clothing, there were two types of seeds from cypress trees. One type of cypress was quite common, but one type was particularly rare. They also found that embedded in Graham's clothing was some pink and white mortar. So what they thought from all of that was that Graham's body had been in the underground part of a house or near to the foundations of a house where pink and white mortar was present and that on the ground it had come into contact with these two types of seeds. The forensic scientists were also able to detect two types of hair, not just one. And they did extensive testing on the hairs and found that one type of hair came from a dog and it was most probably a Pekingese dog. The other type of hair was human hair and it was female hair with a red henna rinse around it. Now, it took many, many weeks for all of that testing to be done. But at the end of all of that testing, the police knew that they were looking for a man who had a foreign accent, who had been driving an iridescent blue Ford Custom Line car, who probably lived or had an association with a building that had pink and white mortar, that in the same location there were probably two types of cypress tree that they knew which types, and that these premises were associated with a Pekingese dog and a woman who used a red henna rinse in her hair. So that's a lot of information about someone. And the two or three police officers who were the main investigators spent a lot of time driving around looking for a house that fitted the description of those two cypress trees and the pink and white mortar in the vicinity of Seaforth where Graham's body had been found. And the main police officer who was involved in this investigation was a Detective Sergeant Mick Coleman, who had two other detectives working with him. Now, Sergeant Coleman had a completely different view about this kidnapper to the views of his superiors. He thought this kidnapper doesn't live all that far away from where the body was found. And the other police who are involved in this investigation poo-pooed that idea and said, look, you know, any kidnapper is going to go far away from where they live and going to deposit the body somewhere quite remote from any place that they have an association with. But Coleman was absolutely adamant, no, he thought that the kidnapper lived somewhere near to where the body was found. And he started conducting searches for a house that fitted the description of having the two cypress trees and pink and white mortar in the foundations. And he looked and he looked and he looked and he spent days and days looking but couldn't find anything. So then finally he went to the mail exchange at Balgala, which is near Seaforth and which covered the Seaforth area, 
and spoke to all of the postmen who delivered mail. And he told the postman about these findings and asked them to keep an eye out for a house that had those features. Now, very shortly after that, a particular postman saw a house that he thought had both those cypress trees and the sergeant had shown photos of the cypress trees to the postman and pink and white mortar. But unfortunately, the message didn't get to the right police officers and it was only fortuitously a week or two later that Sergeant Coleman happened to be at the home of the people who had discovered the body in uh, Seaforth and was told about this postman who had seen a house that he thought fitted the description. So Sergeant Coleman then found out what the address was of the house and went to the house in Clontarf and his hair just stood on end because he realised this is where the kidnapper had Graham Thorne. It fitted the description. There was an underground part of a house under the floorboards that had easy access to an alcove under the house from the garage and there was mortar all over the ground and you could see that the wind had swept in leaves and seeds from the garden into the garage and into the alcove. So he realised that this house exactly matched the description of what they were looking for. He then found out that the owner of the house had been a man by the name of Stephen Bradley, but that Stephen Bradley had moved out of the house on the very day of the kidnapping. And a few weeks later, Stephen Bradley and his family had left Australia on a P&O ocean liner to go overseas and that they were on their way purportedly to London. But at the time that they realised that Stephen Bradley was the kidnapper, he was in the middle of the Indian Ocean on this uh, ocean line of the Himalaya and the next port of call was Colombo, which of course the country was then called Ceylon, that's now called Sri Lanka and it was part of the Commonwealth and the police immediately set in train measures to have Stephen Bradley taken off the ship, arrested, kept in custody, and then extradition proceedings were commenced to bring him back to Sydney for trial. Before we get to that, can you tell us a little bit more about Stephen's family? Because he also had young kids, didn't he? Stephen Bradley was a 34-year-old Hungarian immigrant. He'd come to Australia in 1950. His original name was Stefan Baranier. He had a very difficult childhood and adolescence during the Nazi occupation of Hungary during the Second World War. Came to Australia as an immigrant in 1950 and settled in Melbourne where he married another Hungarian immigrant called Eva in 1952. They had a daughter. Tragically, in 1955, Eva died in a car accident in which the brakes of her car mysteriously failed. About eight months later, Stephen Bradley met another Hungarian immigrant, Magda, whom he immediately fell in love with and uh, they had a very uh, torrid affair together because she was married at the time that they met and she had two boys from her marriage. They started living together. In 1957, they moved to Sydney and they were married in 1958. Ostensibly, they were a typical, successful immigrant couple. But uh, Stephen Bradley had some very unusual character traits that made him different to many other people. Deep down, Stephen was very insecure, jealous of the success of other people. He had an overblown sense of his own entitlement. He had delusions of grandeur and invincibility. He believed that he could see opportunities that others couldn't see. He thought that his respect from other people depended upon the 
the size and value of his house or the flashiness of his car. And he tried to associate with wealthy, powerful people and portray himself as one of them. He was very much aware that in Australia at that time, his foreign accent created a degree of prejudice against him because, I don't know, the attitude towards foreigners was not the same as it is today. He was quite prepared to engage in financial fraud to gain some sort of advantage. He didn't have much empathy for other people outside his immediate family and he had this constant need to be told how impressive and successful he was, especially by Magda. He was a devoted husband to Magda. He was a very good father to their children. And uh, Magda, having failed in the first marriage, was absolutely determined to succeed in this marriage. And she just basically went along with all of Stephen's harebrained financial schemes. Now, after coming to Sydney, Stephen began to work for a life insurance company as a salesman and it was while he was working as a life insurance salesman that he took out a loan from the insurance company and bought a very expensive house in Moore Street at Clontarf and really much more than he could possibly afford but he managed really by fraud to get a loan that was actually more than what he paid for the house. Shortly after that, there was what he called a misunderstanding with the insurance company and some insurance premiums that he had been paid by customers that he should have passed on to the insurance company had not been passed on. So he was let go. So having taken out this big loan, he then lost his job with the insurance company and for reasons that I cannot understand, he became employed by a poker machine manufacturer in Darlinghurst, working as an electroplater. His salary was far less than what he'd be making with the insurance company, and he was basically in dire financial straits and faced the prospect of losing his house. And it was in that desperate financial circumstance that his completely narcissistic personality produced a belief in him that he had to take extreme action to avert financial disaster and to avert the shame, particularly with his wife, of losing their home. And it was at that time that he saw this photograph in the newspaper of Basil Thorne holding the winning lottery ticket of £100,000 with his name and his address in the paper. At around that same time, he'd seen an article in a magazine about the kidnappings overseas that I mentioned earlier. It was a combination of all of that that convinced Stephen Bradley that he would kidnap it one of the children of Basil Thorne, and he wasn't going to be greedy about it. He wasn't going to demand the whole £100,000. He'd only demand £25,000. So, And he had no conception that there might be any risk to the life of this child or that he might cause extreme distress to the parents of this child when he kidnapped the boy. And he had no conception of the fact that there would be massive media attention to the kidnapping for ransom of this child. He thought, oh, look, within a short period of time, the money will be paid, I'll return the boy to his family, and everybody will live happily ever after. And, of course, in that belief, he was totally deluded. He was also totally deluded because he conducted surveillance of their home from a park opposite where they lived, He got the phone number attached to their home from the exchange, but when he rang the number, it was not connected. And that's why three weeks before the kidnapping, he knocked on the door and asked Frida Thorne whether this was her phone number. 
and found out that it hadn't yet been connected but was going to be connected a few days later. So it never occurred to him that by doing that he was marking himself out as being the kidnapper. So his approach to the Thorn household was just so foolish. But there's a difference between a kidnapping and a murder. How did it go so wrong? It went wrong because Stephen Bradley imprisoned Graham Thorne in the boot of his car. And he would put a gag around the mouth of the boy. And the reason why he did that was that on the very same day that he conducted this kidnapping, there was a firm of removalists that was taking the Bradley's possessions away from their home because they'd sold their home. And he faced the prospect that these removalists might hear the boy calling out from inside the boot of the car. So he gagged the boy, he placed him in the boot of the car, and at some stage he hit him on the head with a blunt object and the boy died from the effect of being hit on the head and from a lack of oxygen in the boot of the car with the gag on. So it was a combination of factors that caused the death of this boy and of course causing the death of the boy was completely against his own interests because he must have known that he would probably need to produce evidence that the boy was alive to get the ransom Stephen goes to trial for this murder. He's, he's, you know, convicted. He's found guilty of murder and he goes to prison. What was the public reaction like to that? Because all eyes were on this case from the moment it started. So I have no doubt it, it would have been huge. Uh, the reaction of the public was jubilation. There was literally a mass of people outside the courthouse at Taylor Square at Darlinghurst dancing in the street with jubilation at the fact that this man had been convicted because the evidence against him was overwhelming. Did the Thorne family feel like they had justice with his imprisonment? The Thorne family was broken and Basil Thorne died some years later of a broken heart. They never recovered from this and you can understand why. It was just the most terrible tragedy that befell their family and... Look, none of them really ever recovered from it. Do you think it also changed the way we functioned as a society? Because I know back in the 60s, there was the whole, you know, come back when the lights are on in the street kind of thing. But this was like a real kind of warning about stranger danger. Look, it completely changed the way in which children were given freedom to wander around their neighbourhood and play in their neighbour's yards and go playing in the nearby bushland and things like that. It completely changed Australia in that way and parents became much more protective towards their children. I can't tell you the number of people who have come up to me at talks that I've given about this book and told me that their lives changed markedly after the kidnapping of Graham Thorne and their parents would no longer allow them to roam freely around their neighbourhood and They'd be restricted to their backyards. They wouldn't be allowed to go around without parents in the same way that they did before. It changed Australia. Is it true that this crime also influenced what would become your future career? Look, to be honest with you, I had wanted to be a lawyer from when I was five, which I know is very strange. (laughs) But at the time, my father was working as a court interpreter translating for Italian people who were appearing in the magistrate's court, what we now call the local court. And he was coming home with these incredible tales about people whom he translated for. And I I think it was that that convinced me that I wanted to become a lawyer rather than what happened to Graham Thorne. But I, I certainly did identify very closely with Graham. And I think any child who was aware of what had happened who was around the same age, would have been well aware of it. And anybody older uh, would remember it very vividly. There have really only been two crimes in Australia that have had massive attention around the world, and this was one of them. The other one was, of course, the death of Azaria Chamberlain 
which also went around the world. But this case had the same sort of publicity around the world that the um, Azaria Chamberlain disappearance did, and 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 the trial of Stephen Radley attracted about as much attention as the trial of Lindy and Michael Chamberlain. And it also kind of changed the way police worked, didn't it? Because forensic science, as you were saying earlier, it was a new kind of area for police. Yeah, forensic science really became a mainstream of police investigations at around that time. And it introduced techniques that had never been used before. And it changed the police approach to a lot of their investigations. Thanks to Mark Tedeschi for assisting us to tell this story. You can find a link to his book, Kidnapped, in our show notes. And a big thanks to anyone listening who's become a Mamma Mia subscriber. Subscribers get access to every podcast, exclusive videos and all the great articles on Mamma Mia. And of course, you'll be supporting our team of female journalists and producers. Subscriptions cost as little as $5.75 a month. There's a link in our show notes too. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, and my executive producer is Gia Moylan. I'll be back next week discussing the disappearance of Queensland woman Sharon Phillips back in May 1986. See you then.